Good evening, everybody. This is 12 Gauge. Glad to see you all here. If this is your first time to my channel, welcome. I hope you find something that you can enjoy, something that will make your mind elevate a little bit. Hit the like, hit the subscribe. Take a stroll. There's plenty of stuff on here. There's true crime. There's substance abuse information. There's concert footage. There's a little bit of everything in here. So if you like what you see, leave a comment. Let me know how I'm doing. And tonight, I'm going to talk about codependent behaviors and traits. If you've ever been exposed to somebody with substance use issues, drugs, alcohol, porn, gambling, eating, any of that stuff, um, then take a look at tonight's stream and see if possibly you can gain some tools that can take care of yourselves and possibly those that you love and care about. You know, I've been doing this for about 18 years plus, and this is my specialty. The true crime stuff is just merely a hobby at this point because I'm getting my bachelor's in criminal justice, so... I'm dabbling in that, just trying to get a feel about the process, about the, the legal issues and things of that nature. Substance abuse is my specialty. Like I said, um, I want to discuss some things with you guys, and hopefully by the end of the stream, you'll get some information that can assist you or your loved one, because this is a battle that doesn't go away no matter how much time come between the addiction and the sober date because, you know, that relapse can happen at any time. And we will discuss relapse as well. Hope you enjoy. Okay, it says codependency, boundaries, and detaching. Although codependency, boundaries, and detaching are separate terms associated with addiction, they are also interconnected one with one another. Understanding the behaviors of all three of these terms described can help us interact with our addictive loved ones in a healthier manner.
Okay, so at this point, you're disappointed. You start to have the negative emotions about being lied to, being manipulated. The pain and the hurt that you feel because this individual continues to do what they do to you. No matter how much you try to love them, shame them, tough love, any of this stuff, they're still doing what they're doing to you. And it physically causes problems with you due to internalizing all the emotion that you really need to speak to this person, but you're unable to because they don't handle it well. They look at every situation as a starting of a fight, an argument, a disagreement. So it's hard for you to want to change somebody who doesn't want to change themselves. And I hope that you saw what it said about how it changes your way of functioning. I'm going to start right here. It says, exhaustion is a result when I use my energy and mold mulling over the past with regret or in trying to figure a way to escape a future that has yet to arrive, projecting an image of the future and anxiously hovering over it for fear will or won't come true, uses all my energy and leaves me unable to live today, yet living today is the only way I have a life. I will have no thought for the future action of others, neither expecting them to do better or worse as a time goes on. For in such expectations I'm really trying to create, I will love and let be. All people are always changing. If I try to judge them, I do so only on what I think I know about them. Failing to realize there's much I do not know, I will give others credit for attempt of progress for having had many victories which are unknown. I too am always changing and I can make that change constructive one. If I am willing, I can change myself. Others, I can only love. So, we are talking about detaching with love. We're talking about how we can help this individual by not damaging ourselves. So, think about um, learning to detach your feelings from an individual that continu continuously does not know how to live life on life's terms. As a therapist, we learn to use motivational interviewing. This is basically meeting the client where they're at rather than where you want them to be because a lot of times we want them to be sober. We want them to be productive. We want them to be trusting, trustworthy, all these things we want from them. But if you push these things too fast, you're going to be let down because you're doing it for you, not in the basis of where they're able to replicate the tools that they've learned. You can't constantly talk sobriety to somebody who's getting sober. You got to learn to engage with them and learn who they are again on a sober level. Just because you know them does not mean that you do, that you know them really anymore because that, that wedge that was placed between you, whatever it was, created a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of chaos. And now you have to have tools in order to deal with this person. But you can't be fixated on talking sobriety with them 24-7. If you don't know what to talk to them about, talk to them about, you know, how their day went. Or just ask them, hey, is there anything you want to talk about? You like football? You like, you know, what's your favorite cake? What, you know, just random stuff. Because, you know, early on in sobriety, the last thing you want is somebody to hound you about your recovery because you're so uncertain yourself about it that that's the last thing you want to vocalize is your fear that you might go and relapse tonight. Let's talk about boundaries. Boundaries help to create healthy relationships through open communication and respect for ourselves and others. If our addictive loved ones make demands upon us, we have the right to say yes or we have the right to say no. We learn to understand and communicate where our responsibility ends and allow our loved ones to begin to comprehend where their responsibilities begin. Whether or not our loved ones are ready to take on their new responsibilities is irrelevant. 
It is their business, not ours. Does that mean we just abandon our loved ones? No. We have a responsibility to be there for them in healthy ways, but not in unhealthy ways. If our boundaries are too rigid, we might drive our loved ones away. If we have no boundaries, then our wishes and desires are usually not met, and eventually we just get too tired and stop trying. Either extreme is not good for relationships. So think about setting a boundary with somebody. A boundary would be, hey, if you're going to borrow my car, don't have anybody in it. Don't give anybody a ride. Don't loan it to anybody. Fill it up with gas or at least put the amount of gas that you took out in it. Make sure you you treat my car with respect and have it back on time. That's setting a boundary. So if any of those rules that you have placed in that boundary are violated, that gives you the opportunity to say, well, look, these are some areas that you failed to maintain, and I'm going to give you another shot. What do you think you need to do to change that? And give the individual the ability to to change their behavior, not you giving them the answer. Because, you know, it sounds silly that you have to do this to an adult. Well, most adults at this point, because the emotional attachment that we were talking about just a couple of minutes ago means that you're attached more to this change than the person who is trying to learn to change. Even if it's an adult, this person has probably not been very consistent with rules, guidelines, or discipline. So you have to maintain that. You don't have to get into a fight. It's your vehicle. It's your house. It's your it's your ability to be helping this person if you choose to do so. If they fail to violate the boundaries and you get to the point where you're like, man, I'm tired of trying. You need to go get yourself right, and then we can try it again. Detaching with love is not a cold, hostile withdrawal. A form of punishment towards our loved ones, a physical separation from our loved ones, becoming emotionally separate and aloof, putting binders on ourselves and ignoring concerns, living in denial, ignoring our responsibility to ourselves and others, giving up our our addictive loved ones, selflessly focusing only on our own lives. Detaching with love is stopping negative thought patterns that interfere with our peace, processing our negative emotions, letting go of codependent behaviors, Okay, let's try this again. That dog keeps interrupting me. Um, Processing our negative emotions, letting go of codependent behaviors, choosing to avoid nagging and constant criticism, communicating respectfully, recognizing positive qualities in our loved one, sincerely expressing gratitude towards our addicted loved ones, establishing healthy boundaries, communicating our boundaries without shaming, blaming, or using anger, not allowing our concern to become worries and cause us suffering, honestly expecting our concerns, letting go of our own solutions, always relying on the guidance of our higher power, understanding what we can change and what we cannot change, giving others the freedom to be responsible and to grow, releasing our burdens and cares, giving ourselves the freedom to enjoy life in spite of our own solve problems, living happily, focusing on what is good in our lives, and being grateful, accepting reality, present moment living, living in the here and now, and faith in ourselves and God and other people. So, um, I can talk about this without having to read every little bit of it. Um, It's maritalintimacyinst.com if you want to go read it. I can tell you that, whoa, 
I didn't know I was on camera. Bad hair day. Anyways, um, when it comes to codependent behavior, your addictive individual in your life may tell you. Let me try this again. When it comes to codependent behavior in your lives, your addictive one may tell you, hey, I don't have the problem. You're the one with the problem with my drinking, my drugging, my porn addiction, my overeating, my gambling, whatever it might be, my overworking. You know, um, a lot of times people honestly don't, they don't, I don't want to use the word nag because that's such an ugly word, but they don't speak their mind about situations if they didn't care or love you. You get what I'm saying? If somebody didn't love you, they wouldn't care to even talk about anything that you're doing that could potentially hurt the family or hurt them. Um, but some of you have had these addictions for a very long time. It's hard just to give it up. It's hard just to walk away from it. You know, some people lose their lives to the addiction. Some people never get the gift of sobriety. Some people don't ever get to understand that there's more life than sobriety or than their addiction. I'm sorry. Because most of the time people, they want to control everything in their lives. So they look at me going and having a drink every night after work, a happy hour as, okay, let's try this again. Um, you know, when it comes to codependent behaviors, you turn on yourself because some of the behaviors that you see in your addictive ones dealing with, they might even tell you, I don't feel good enough at this. I, I feel like a loser. I feel like a failure. I feel like this, that, and the other. That's why I drink. That's why I drug. That's why I enjoy it. That's my escape. Leave me alone. Weed's not a bad thing. It helps me relax. It helps me do this. No judgment here. Whatever you do, that is your thing. But do understand that if it's causing you your family, if it's causing you your job, if it's causing you trust with others, and you're losing, losing, losing because of this one thing, you definitely have a problem. And it's past the party stage, if that makes sense. You know, um, once you get sober, once your loved one gets sober, I would recommend that you go to Al-Anon or some kind of therapy group to assist in you being able to discuss all the things that you hold on to. Because this is a family disease. Just because somebody gets sober in the family does not mean that the family is still not sick. Think of it as wheels of gears, okay? Here's the addicted one. Here's the, the wife. So for years, they were going like this and you were going like this. Now they get clean and they're starting to go like this and you're still going like this. There's going to be a lot, a lot of uh, uncertainty in their sobriety. There's going to be a lot of uncertainty in their honesty. There's going to be a lot of uncertainty in the ability to stay sober and how long. That is not your concern. That is their recovery. You leave it to themselves. You don't question them whenever they leave the house. How, Where are you going? How long are you going to be gone? This, that, and the other. You leave it to them to govern themselves. And if they ask you, hey, I want you to, to tell me what I'm doing wrong, I want you to just say this. Hey, it's not my responsibility because that usually starts a fight. I want you to govern yourself and to take a inventory and to figure out when you're starting to stray a little bit, you know, and 
it's a tough battle. It doesn't just go away overnight. If it took 20 years to get there, it's going to take 20 years probably to get better. Let's hope not. But, you know, whatever you put into it, you get out of it. So, you know, um, many times I've had family members tell me, hey, they don't want to do meetings. They don't want to go to meetings. They don't want to, you know, read the literature. They don't want to do that. They don't want to do that. You can't force somebody to do something they don't want to do. But do you understand if you've never done these things, maybe that's the reason why you keep going backwards. You know? I'm going to share a short video here. Hold on a second. Check this out. My name is Mike Johnson. I'm a drug counselor. I'm going to give you uh, a presentation that will deal with your relapse dynamic and your setup for relapse. Okay? That's what I'm going to work on today. Here's the thing, though. A lot of us don't understand that when we deal with the lifestyle that we in and the lifestyle that we enjoy, there are some certain options for us. All right? Some of those options are death, jail, addiction, insanity. Okay, so look at that. In the drug-addicted lifestyle... These are the things that are certainties. You're going to die due to your lifestyle. You're going to go to jail. You're going to become addicted. You're going to be insane. Or you can end up broke. And broke. All right? The thing is, is that too often we fall into one of those categories or getting close to a few of them. Am I right or wrong? Okay, when you look at your behavior, when you look at your lifestyle, all right, I'm headed for one of these five categories based on the kind of a activities I'm involved in and the appetite that I have. Am I right or wrong? Okay, that's the main thing I need to look at. I also need to know that as it relates to goals, priorities, Okay, these are the problem areas that a drug addict usually have. They have no goals. They have no priorities. Their responsibility is bad. Their focus is not there, and their discipline is not there. Responsibility and our being focused and maintaining a certain amount of discipline that is an area we having problems in. One thing that I find is always relative to the relapse dynamic of individuals involved in the criminal justice system who also use mood altering chemicals, they are not real clear on what their goals or priorities are. Oftentimes when they talk about their goals and priorities, what they're doing is giving the counselor a lot of lip service and trying to tell a, tell a counselor what the counselor want to hear. We say things like, I'm going to church, I'll get a job, uh, I'm going to spend time with my family, uh, uh, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to use 12-step groups. That's what we tell a counselor. That may also be some of the things that we truly desire to do. Am I right or wrong? But there's another part of us that always has a certain hidden motive, like, Many of you sitting here right now, you may want to give up alcohol and you may want to give up drugs, but there's something else that you don't want to give up. What might that be? That's closely associated to the alcohol and the drugs. Lifestyle. What you mean by lifestyle? Well, I mean, if you're involved in drugs, you're involved in drug people, looks, uh, cars, things like that. Okay, okay. Now watch this one. When he talks about lifestyle, here's something else. There's another corner. Okay, this is the drug addict's lifestyle. They they want sex, money, material things, family, and loved ones. But as he said, in order to get these things in their lives, they're making a lot of promises and deals. 
they're making a lot of promises and deals where they're telling you, hey, if you if you let me have some sex, if you let me have jewelry, material things, if you let me borrow the car, I'll go to treatment. I'll stay sober. I'll do this, that, and the other. So they're unable to maintain that because they don't have the middle box, as he was saying. So up here in this corner, the material things and the lifestyle, without having the middle box, it's going to take you to the other side where it talks about broke, institutionalized, death, jail, which a lot of times that's exactly what happens because you need the middle box in order to stay functional. And many people that I've seen across the desk from me, they're unable to stay functional. They'll come in and just like the individual said, they'll say a lot of good things. They'll, they'll tell you exactly what you want to hear just to get the weekend pass, to get a good report to their PO. And as soon as they leave the group or as soon as they leave the individual session, guess what they're off and running to do? What they really want to do. You know, I'm going to go report. Okay, I'm clean. Now I'm going to go get high for three days. Because I know I don't have to come come back to group or to an individual till next week. You know, I have to report till next week. So therefore, I'm good. But in the meantime, they're making promises and deals to the family. Yes, I'm staying clean. Yes, I'm doing this. Let me have this. Let me have that. Let me go hang out with so-and-so. Let me go hang out with so-and-so. And most of the time, the people that you're hanging out with, those aren't the people that are concerned about you going to jail, you going to institutions, you going to the grave. These people are the ones that are leading the way to those places. But it's unfortunate that you're too stubborn to see that. I hope you've enjoyed this. I will make a part two because I could go on for hours and hours and hours and I don't want to lose your attention. But if you liked what you saw, hit a like, give me a comment. The dog seems to like it. He's giving me his barking approval. I'll try to make sure that the dog is in less of these videos.